This video is sponsored by Squarespace. If you want to know what a website and a Victorian bodice have in common, keep watching. Also, spoilers ahead for Daniel Deronda. Don't say I didn't warn you. They were both a little more anxious than was comfortable, lest Mira should not be heard to advantage. Deronda had escaped as soon as he could from the side of Lady Pentreath, who had said in her violoncello voice, Well, your Jewess is pretty. There's no denying that. But where's her Jewish impudence? She looks as demure as a nun. I suppose she learned that on the stage. He was beginning to feel, on Mira's behalf, something of what he had felt for himself in his seraphic boyish time, when Sir Hugo asked him if he would like to be a great singer. An indignant dislike to her being remarked on in a free and easy way, as if she were an imported commodity disdainfully paid for by the fashionable public. And he winced the more because Mordecai, he knew, would feel that the name Jewess was taken as a sort of stamp, like the lettering of Chinese silk. This is the scene, or part of it, that set me to creating this 1860s evening gown. The George Eliot novel Daniel Deronda and its 2002 BBC adaptation were the first time I saw myself represented in the sort of setting and literature that the historical costuming world looks to as our ideal and inspiration. The reader finds themselves in the audience as Mira Lapidoth, a young Jewish woman trained as an opera singer, stands before a drawing room of English gentry and prepares to sing a concert that could make or break her career, knowing full well that many watching her will feel similarly to Lady Pentreath. Her dress, perhaps deliberately, is not described, but I'm sewing one for her anyways. While Daniel Deronda was published in 1876, a time of sweeping Victorian bustle gowns, the story takes place in 1864 and 65. The skirt was sewn in a previous video, which you can find in the upper right corner. Evening gown bodices were very similar to the 1850 styles I have more practice with, so I can use a pattern I've worked with before. Having cut out the cotton twill interlining and assembled it to check that my pattern still fits, I can cut out my silk. All we know about Mira's dress is that it's new and she needed much convincing to shop for it, so I've chosen silk taffeta in a color that I think no one who knows me will be surprised at. I decided to get a little creative with the flat lining for the back pieces, and this is how. Most of the bodice pieces are just flat lined as normal. Slap a layer of twill and a layer of silk together and baste around the edges and treat them as one piece. But the center back pieces I'm gonna do differently. This bodice has a back lacing closure and I need to add some stability for the eyelets. But I also don't wanna necessarily stitch through the outside layer and have a really obvious boning channel or anything there because I am a sucker for a really clean finish. This pattern has a built-in sort of extra inch at the center back that you're supposed to do some kind of facing with. I don't know, I never follow pattern instructions. I just come up with my own things. I'm gonna separate the two layers instead of treating them together first. And I'm gonna fold this back piece in and instead of just seaming them together or something, I'm gonna create like a little teeny internal boning channel here just by sewing this down for a piece of this uh, six millimeter, 1.5 millimeter thing synthetic whale bone. And then just trim away the excess. And then what I'm gonna do is actually just place this on top of the silk layer. The center back is on the selvage. And while I wish I could say I did this on purpose, I just did it because it was easy. It's actually gonna make things much easier now because now what I can do is fold this extra inch of the silk over and then just stitch it down next to the boning channel going only through the twill layer. So then when I wrap it around to the outside to flat line, I'll have that internal boning channel already, but nothing will be visible on the outside. This bodice is fitted with darts at the front. I like to mark and then stitch down the center line so the fabric and interlining don't separate or slide out of place. Mm -hmm. 
Then I'm hand basting the darts using a ladder stitch, which will fold them up perfectly when I pull it tight. It's just a running stitch that goes through one line, straight across to the other, and then back on the next stitch. This is much more precise than pinning and less likely to go wonky when I run it through the machine. I'm also hand sewing eyelets for the back lace enclosure. You can definitely use metal eyelets, but I like the way hand sewn ones look and I also like sewing them. Otherwise, this would be torture. Using an awl to make the holes will disrupt the fibers too much, so I'm using a punch tool to make the holes. The eyelets are made with a buttonhole stitch in cotton crochet thread. I couldn't find a color match in Silk Twist and this is cheaper and works incredibly well. While Past V is sewing a million eyelets, I thought I'd give you a quick update on my website. Squarespace is very kindly hosting my site as well as sponsoring this little series of videos. It's starting to actually come together and look website shaped. My friend who's good at graphics has loaded in some super pretty backgrounds to play with. There are loads of pre-built page templates, but if I have something really specific in mind, I can custom build pages from all these different sections like blogs, videos, I'll definitely be using those. And the controls for changing everything are really intuitive. I feel so much less lost than the last time I tried to build a website. Much like past V and this bodice, we're still sort of prepping the pieces. In the meantime, if you're feeling so inspired, head to squarespace.com slash snappy dragon for a 10% discount on your first website or domain purchase. You go forth and construct your website. I'm gonna go construct this bodice. After all the prep work, the actual assembly process on Victorian bodices always goes really quickly. It seems a little unfair until you realize that under the Bertha collar and all its decoration, no one's going to be looking at this part. After a week in San Diego playing with my uncle's corgi, I got back to work on all the fluffy decorative parts of the bodice. My patrons helped me choose how to trim the sleeves, based off this ball gown by prior attire that I have been in love with since my first explorations of Coztube in 2018. Yes, I'm basically copying it, and no, I feel no shame. And if you too would like to help my indecisive self out, join my Patreon and vote on my polls. The outer sleeve is gathered at the top and bottom to a more fitted lining, turning it into a small poof. This is why I attached a lace trim before sewing the outer sleeve to the lining. Both pieces are sewn together at the ends before gathering, so all the raw edges can go on the inside. I always do gathered sleeves the same way. Match the seams, pin, pull the gathers to the correct length, and distribute them evenly afterwards. I'm not being very precise with these because they also will be mostly hidden by lace, and the machine will move them anyways when the seams are sewn. The bottom of the sleeve is done right sides together, and then the whole thing is turned before gathering the top. The process is repeated to gather the top of the poof, and then the sleeves can be set in. It's pretty much the same thing a third time. Match seam to notch, pin, flip inside out, arrange the rest of the sleeve. Once the sleeves are in, the bodice construction is done. I'm finishing all the raw edges with machine overcasting, and then moving on to the finishing touches. The bodice is supposed to lace closed edge to edge, but just in case, I'm going to add a simple rectangular modesty panel. 
A piece of silk the length of the bodice is sewn around the edges, turned out, and then an internal boning channel is added so the panel won't crumple up. I'm sewing it to the interlining at the center back by hand, careful not to catch the outer layer. This style of bodice needs boning, just enough to keep it sitting smoothly. The channels are half-inch cotton twill tape, whip stitched to the side seam allowances and all four front darts. The Bertha is the big, dramatic, V-shaped collar or neckline decoration characteristic of mid-19th century evening bodices. I like the look of long, horizontal pleats meeting in the center of the V-shape, but I don't want the fuss of actually doing the pleats. Instead, I'm cutting strips on a shallow bias and sewing them onto the base pieces so they overlap and look like pleats. The first strip is sewn onto the top edge right sides together, then ironed around to the outside. The next strip is pinned on top of it, right sides together, and the process repeats. Each strip has to be sewn on and ironed before the next one can be added, so there's a lot of back and forth between ironing board, work table, and machine. I'm using placement marks at both ends of the Bertha pieces to ensure the faux pleats are all even. When the last strip is on, the raw edges are folded under and top stitched down, and all four pieces are sewn together. The right shoulder is left open and the edges are overcast instead. To match the skirt, I'm using a narrow black velvet ribbon at the top and bottom edges of the Bertha, a wider velvet ribbon at the shoulder seams, and a veil of wide black lace at the bottom edge. The boning for this bodice is mostly 4mm synthetic whalebone, which is extremely light and flexible. The cut edges smooth out well with sandpaper, although it feels disconcertingly like filing your fingernails. The center back will get 6mm bones, which are also thicker, to handle the tension of the lacing. In place of piping, which I don't have materials for, I'm stabilizing the curved bottom edge of the bodice with some twill tape. Lastly, the Bertha is whipped to the top edge of the bodice. The back right quarter is left unattached so the bodice opens fully. It will fasten with two hooks and eyes at the right shoulder, sneakily hidden under that bit of black velvet ribbon. There's something special about helping your friends get dressed for an event. Whether it's in a proper dressing room, a chaotic backstage, or just someone's back bedroom. It's been a long time since I've been to a costume event. This is nothing like the stately musical evening that Mara gives her performance at, but it's going to be great fun in this dress all the same. The irony of showing off this gown at a Christmas party isn't lost on me. The cast and crew of the Dickens Christmas Fair is still on strike for anti-racism policies, so a number of us checked each other's vaccination cards and then threw a bloody great party to celebrate our favorite things about Dickens Fair. Dressing up together, singing, dancing, and silliness. Goof loof. I'm a play touch. Yes. <laughs> I need to like, mother. <laughs> And all of the Why am I here? <laughs> You're usually a man. I hope wherever you are and whatever holidays you're celebrating, you are safe, warm, and with people you love. I hope you have music and dancing and light and whatever will bring you good cheer. I'll see you in the new year with the daytime version of Mira's dress. What? You didn't think I was done with her yet, did you? I just forgot I put in the pot all stars aside they lay The old and the young doth carol this song To drive the cold winter away When Christmas has time